Tonight, uncommitted and Nikki Haley. The left turns on Biden over Israel. That they were target systematically, car by car. The center rejects Trump and his never-ending rhetoric. No, they're not humans. They're not humans. They're animals. I'll use the word animal because that's what they are. Will the race for the White House end in a stumble? It's the economy. The new magic number for Americans to retire sends shivers through workers everywhere. One million dollars. It's actually more than that. Mike Rowe on why Generation Z traded college dreams for tool belts. Not our strength. A new study shatters the corporate myth of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The new study destroying DEI. And show them the money. Evades Van Lith and drains it. More Americans watch Caitlin Clark than the NBA Finals. To be able to have that impact on the next generation is really special. Will women's sports finally get the respect they deserve? Welcome to the Ferris Show on television. First tonight, Biden's base problem. To be fair, Trump has a similar but slightly different problem. We'll get to that in a minute. Biden's base problem is getting worse by the hour, literally. He is totally boxed in right now by the pro-Hamas protesters and supporters on one side inside the Democratic Party and the Jewish lobby on the other. It's not just on Gaza, but climate, immigration, DEI, and a few other of the progressive left's most loved causes. The left, especially the celebrity left, loves nobody more than Chef Jose Andres. So this focuses on the Israel problem for Joe Biden. Andres owns a bunch of restaurants in D.C. They're good. He sued former President Trump, so now he's very popular among the left. And now he's demanding action from President Biden on Gaza and Israel. He runs World Central Kitchen, a relief group that does some very important and noble work in terrible places. On Monday, an Israeli airstrike killed seven of his aid workers in Gaza. All accounts and evidence point to a terrible accident, but much like the left and much of the left, Jose Andres is angry. This was not just a bad luck situation where, oops, uh, we dropped the bomb in the wrong place. They were targeting us in a deconflicting zone, in an area controlled by IDF. Them knowing that was our teams moving on that route with two armor, with three cars. And then they hit the third one. And... Andres doesn't go as far as the pro-Hamas protesters on the streets of New York or D.C. Some were chanting to bomb Tel Aviv. But he does carry a lot of weight. President Biden reportedly called him and then, frankly, did nothing. From Politico, Biden not changing Israel policy after deadly strikes on aid workers. Some of his senior officials thinks it's, quote, a blatantly stupid, horrific mistake. Blatantly horrific and stupid mistake. One of Obama's top strategists said the article only makes Biden look weak. As we said, his problems keep getting worse literally by the hour that article dropped a couple of hours ago. Last night in Connecticut and Wisconsin, the anybody but Biden vote uncommitted averaged about 10 percent. That's on top of a sizable amount from Rhode Island. An even larger share of voters earlier this year in Michigan, Washington and Minnesota. Biden either can't or won't pick a lane between supporting Israel and letting it rescue its hostages or supporting the protesters who, much like Hamas, won't be happy until Israel is gone. All of this only emboldens Hamas. The terrorist group still won't agree to the Qatari and Egyptian ceasefire proposal. They know a big part of the Democratic Party in America is on their side, on Hamas's side. Listen to the group's chief explain their demands for a ceasefire. We are committed to our demands, the permanent ceasefire, comprehensive and complete withdrawal of the enemy out of the Gaza Strip. And precisely no mention of the 134 hostages held beneath the ground in Gaza, the men, women and children subjected to rape and torture on a daily basis. They've been forgotten by so many. General Phil Breedlove is here, retired U.S. Air Force, Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, 2013 to 2016. Uh, 
General, it's always good to see you. Thank you. Um, if you just sort of look at the strategic picture, we zoom out, not politically, but purely militarily, of the, of the major players, Hamas, uh, Iran, President Biden, the United States, and Israel. And you pick a date, say two or three months ago. It seems as though that Hamas and Iran are in a better and stronger position today in the United States and Israel and President Biden are in a weaker one than a couple of months ago. Am I wrong? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's been a while and good to see you again. So I think you're reading it pretty well. Here we have a conflict that is carried forward in a way that the world opinion is getting more strident against it. And frankly, we have to remember that this is exactly what Iran and Hamas wanted. Hamas knew they couldn't beat Israel on that day that they went in and and did all the horrific things they did. They wanted to kick the hornet's nest and then elicit a response and then use the world opinion to accomplish their objectives against Israel. And it's working fairly well. Look, there's always fair criticism of Israel. I've, I live there. I've covered the conflict. No army is perfect. But you've been on the other side of these airstrikes. You've been in the command and control centers ordering them. You've been the one dropping the bombs. Uh, you were the one ordering uh, bombs to be dropped to protect me when I was in Libya. Um, we took great solace in that. Thank you. Um, but I, the, the criticism and the, the standard that Israel is being held to, uh, as tragic as the aid workers being killed is, is it a fair standard? Is it the same standard applied to other civilized armies? So may I just say that this right up front, this is horrible. And what happened is horrible. These things happen in war. I was listening to the gentleman make it look like Israel went out to specifically bomb this convoy. I think that's a really bad notion. And he's just angry. Uh, Israel has stepped up to what happened here. They are going to run an investigation, and I think these things will take their course. And before we get too critical, again, acknowledging this is a horrible result, but before we get too, too critical, we need to stand in front of a, a mirror as Americans. Our hands are not clean in this. We hit doctors in Afghanistan, and, and there are these kinds of mistakes that happen in war. But there is a difference between a mistake and a crime, and I think that the investigation will find that out here, and we need to be patient and let that happen. But if you think a war like this is going to go on without something like this happening from time to time, I think you don't understand what we've always called the fog of war. You think about what's happening um, at the White House right now. Muslim leaders have declined the White House invitation for Ramadan. Um, they demanded a meeting on policy. Uh, we, we've seen, we see now this continued push, um, not now just by the far left, but by the center left uh, against President Biden, who seems to want to have it both ways. And we said this, uh, pick a lane, either come down on Israel and say we're conditioning aid, we're holding back fighter planes, we're holding back bombs until you stop, or take the handcuffs off and say go rescue your hostages, just purely from a military standpoint, and you've had to you've had to advise presidents um, on these things. Is the middle of the road uh, trying to have it both ways that the Biden administration wants to have? Is that even possible? That's a really tough road to try to drive. Um, we don't have enough time today, Leland, but you, we need to go back to what our national interests are in this area. What does Iran mean to America as a threat? What does Israel mean to America as an ally in the area? And from our strategic interests, we look at the ways and means of how we will accomplish a strategy forward. And right now, I, I really don't see that conversation being held. If you were a family member of the hostages, I think you'd have to almost every day be losing a little bit of hope. Well, I, I think you're exactly right. Um, you know, you use at the top of the hour the number 134. I, I'm doubtful that that many are still alive. If the conditions are as horrific as we hear, this is an ugly thing. 
Uh, I like the way your teaser sort of ran. We have all of this complaints from the, uh, the one side, but no discussion of what's going on with the, these uh, prisoners, these, these hostages, whatever you want to call them. And so uh, we need serious people at the table bringing all facets of this to the table. And uh, I, right now I don't see really a lot of serious uh, discussion. General, uh, you were right at the top to note that it's been too long. We're always grateful when you can join us and are looking forward to a time to have you uh, here on set in D.C. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. Yes, sir. We've seen the challenges facing President Biden when we come back. Corey Lewandowski on why President Trump is having his own trouble with a large part of Republicans. And Mike Rowe joins us on the new sticker shock facing Americans nearing retirement age, why the economy is still the number one issue for voters in 2024. Today we are challenging efforts by states and jurisdictions to implement discriminatory, burdensome, and unnecessary restrictions on access to the ballot, including those related to mail-in voting, the use of drop boxes, and voter ID requirements. Attorney General Merrick Garland blasting voter ID requirements back in March. He says many restrictions in Republican states create an unnecessary burden and limit to legitimate voters' right to cast their ballots. And look, everyone should be able to vote. It's a basic tenet of our democracy. Voter fraud, he says, is relatively rare. New data from the Social Security Administration, though, raises a lot of questions. There's been a huge surge in voter registration in swing states. By people registering to vote without a picture ID. They're using the last four digits of a social security number, not just their social security number. It could be anybody's social security number. We have no idea. Texas, 1.25 million registrations going through the Social Security Administration's database in just the past three months. Arizona, swing state, 500,000 plus. Pennsylvania, 255 thousand plus. It's kind of crazy what's happening in these states. All someone needs is the last four digits of a social security number to register. Joining us now, Robert McWitter, a constitutional and criminal law attorney, also ran for attorney general in Arizona at one point. Robert, uh, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you. We have any idea who all these people are who don't have IDs and are registering, what, quarter million people in Pennsylvania? Well, I have to assume there are people newly coming into the state or people who are newly um, of age to be able to vote. Um, So, you know, there's no need to believe that this is some nefarious kind of thing. These are people just registering the vote, which is what we want people to do. Well, you said you look, no, no questions. It's good to have people register to vote. You said you assume um, I get that some people may have not have IDs, but really a a quarter million people in Pennsylvania, half a million people in Arizona in three months um, who all are legal residents and legally in the United States and legally have the right to vote, but just don't happen to have photo IDs? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, look, we have a problem in this country with not getting enough people to vote and enough people to register the vote. I don't see this as being a particularly bad thing. Now, if there's this implication that because of those numbers, there's some kind of conspiracy to falsely register and do those kind of things, the evidence just isn't there um, that that would be any kind of any kind of problem in our system. Well, what, I, I guess if there's no laws about it, would it be there? Well, look, to really influence an election. Uh, let's just take Maricopa County in 2020. Joe Biden won Maricopa County for the first time since Bill Clinton and since before that, uh, uh, Harry Truman. So, OK, so he wins by two percentage points uh, to be able to pull that off. He would have had to have a conspiracy of 48000 people. That's what that two percent accounts for. So those registration numbers. Yeah. OK, fine. Let's let's you know look at what these registration numbers are and that kind of thing. But to say that that somehow explains some kind of conspiracy that's going to affect an election, the evidence just isn't there. Um, generally, conspirators are not that well organized to be able to, you know, impact 48000 people 
Well, yeah, but the, 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 the margin of the popular vote in Arizona was 11,000 people. Um, mm-hmm. You think about the, mar- the margin of, of Donald Trump's victory in Pennsylvania um, in 2016 um, was a little bit bigger than that. Michigan, a little bit smaller than that. Um, we put the number, if, if, if a quarter of the people that have registered to vote without an ID in just the past three months, um, maybe aren't conspiracy folks, but they're illegal immigrants who are being encouraged to vote. That's more than enough to swing the election, isn't it? Oh, absolutely not. Look, there is a specific federal statute that makes it illegal for an immigrant to vote. In the entire four years of the Trump administration, nobody was ever prosecuted under that statute. Um, there is just right, but, not. But if we're not, if we're not going to ask for photo ID for people, and we all know there's a long list of things you need to have a photo ID to do, but if we're not going to ask for photo ID of, the, of, of anybody, how would we ever know? Well, I, I don't. I just don't think photo ID would be the end on be all. I mean, there are people who are undocumented in this country who get photo IDs for whatever. I mean, if that was your point to get a full photo ID so you could register to vote, so you could change the outcome of an election, that's a that's a process you could do regardless of whether you have photo IDs. Now, if you want to have some kind of objective mechanism, people sign up and things like that. I mean, I suppose that's not objectionable, but. To put this as part of a greater narrative that somehow there is widespread fraud, certainly widespread fraud on the part of people who are in the country either as legal or aliens without papers, the evidence just doesn't support that. Um, Usually people without papers want to stay under the radar. They don't want to vote. They don't want to get in trouble and get to the attention of anybody. And um, and so I think that's... Yeah. So that's... Well, hey, look, maybe... maybe, Look, best best thing would be if uh, it's all folks... Legally signing up to vote, as you point out, we need more pe- more people, uh, not less. Robert, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Good talking to you. My Coming up pleasure. next, the average American couple now needs about a million dollars more in retirement savings than they currently have. Mike Rowe joins us on if America's working class can ever get back on their feet. My 13-year-old acts like a puppy again. Almost overnight, she's a different dog. Perfect poops. When people switch their dog's food to the farmer's dog, the effects can seem like magic. But there's no magic involved. It's simply real meat and vegetables with all the nutrients dogs need, instead of highly processed pellets. No tricks, just smarter, healthier pet food delivered in packs portioned for your dog. It's amazing what real food can do. Get 50% off your first order at thefarmersdog.com slash no magic. Keeping up with new TV shows could be such a headache. This show is on one streaming service, that show's on another. It's not entertaining, it's overwhelming. That's why there's Rewind TV, the best classic comedies from the 80s and 90s, all in one place. Hey, those were the days. <laughs> and with no annoying passwords to remember, there's no need to ever change the channel again. Trust me on this one. Don't delay. Watch today all your favorite comedies from the 80s and 90s on Rewind TV. I need more time to file my taxes. Help. On IRS.gov, you can use IRS Free File to get six more months. Or you can submit IRS Form 4868 by the April deadline. If you owe taxes, you can make an electronic payment and get a filing extension with no need to submit Form 4868. Go to IRS.gov for details. But remember, an extension of time to file is not an extension of time to pay what you owe. Retirement can be scary, but only if you're not prepared. That's why AARP created thisispretirement.org. Because unless you've already retired, you're in pretirement and you still have time to plan. Learn about retirement savings options, potential tax breaks, and how you can build savings over time. Visit thisispretirement.org for free resources to help you customize your action plan and feel the retirement fear disappear. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. That's my son, Jared. But the world knew him as recording artist Juice World. At the height of his fame, we lost him to an accidental drug overdose. I'm Carmela Wallace. I started Live Free 999 to remove the stigma and normalize conversations around mental health and substance abuse. I want to ensure that we never lose another Jared. Go to livefree999.org to learn more. If you need urgent support, text LF999 to 741741. Life. It's full of moments, including difficult and disruptive ones like a cancer diagnosis, which is why the groundbreaking work of Stand Up to Cancer is so vital. They bring together top minds from different fields to find new and better treatments so patients can thrive. 
Please join Stand Up to Cancer and Myrtle Beach to help families get back to where they belong, making new memories for years to come. Go to StandUpToCancer.org to see how you can join the mission. You're listening to On Balance with Leland Vitter on News Nation, America's fastest growing cable news network. I'm Scarlett Johansson. My family relied on public assistance to help provide meals for us. These meals fueled my involvement in theater and the arts as a child, which fostered my love for acting. The Feeding America network of food banks helps millions of people put food on the table. You can join the movement to end hunger by donating, volunteering, and advocating. Because when people are fed, futures are nourished. Join the movement to end hunger at feedingamerica.org slash act now. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. You can't escape a traffic jam. Know what else you can't escape? Seasonal allergies. Ah! And you might think you can avoid that coffee stain until... Oh, really? You can't escape a lot of things in life. But you can escape prediabetes. Prediabetes captures one in three adults. There are usually no signs of prediabetes. In fact, most people don't even know they have it. But with early diagnosis, you can change the outcome and prevent or delay type 2 diabetes. Take action by taking the one-minute risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. You might not be able to escape having this song stuck in your head. But you can escape prediabetes. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org today. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Biden loves to brag about the low unemployment numbers and job growth in his administration. And to be fair, those numbers are impressive. But other numbers show why so many Americans don't feel good about the economy. The so-called magic number for retirement is now rising faster than inflation. The Wall Street Journal reports U.S. adults now believe they will need $1.4 million to retire comfortably. That's up $500,000 since 2020, just four years. Kind of begs the question, are you better off four years ago than you are today? Perhaps that's why the Wall Street Journal reports that Gen Z is becoming the tool tool belt tool belt generation. Young workers are going into trades as disenchantment with the college track continues. They cite data that shows enrollment in vocational focused community college up 16% last year. The percentage of students studying construction trades up 23%. Mike Rowe knows a thing or two about blue collar jobs, hosted Dirty Jobs, created the Mike Rowe Works Foundation, which works to close the skill gap. Host of the Way I Heard It podcast. Good to see you, Mike. Thank you. Um, You know, we're always told that Generation Z is lazy and wants to smoke pot and sit in coffee shops. This data would seem to contradict that. (laughs) Look, man, we paint with such a broad brush in this country nowadays on virtually every topic. You could go down the list. And uh, sure, Gen Z is an easy target. And we've all heard the stories of an eroding work ethic. I tell those stories often. But I was really heartened by that article in the journal. In fact, I shared it online because my foundation has been beating this drum for the last 16 years. For every five tradespeople who retire, two replace them. And it's been that way now for over a decade, and that's some really bad math. At the same time, the cost of college has gotten exponentially more expensive, more so, in fact, than any other important thing, more than real estate, more than food, more than energy. Nothing, Leland, in the history of Western civilization has become more expensive more quickly than a four-year degree. So we've had this crazy tension in our, in our workforce and in our educational system for a long time. And Gen Z got the memo. We're, we're seeing lots of people affirmatively go toward trade schools away from massive educational debt onto a path that looks an awful lot like prosperity if you can master a skill that's in demand. Look, in supply and demand, right? Five, five retiring, two taking their places. That means that pay um, goes up. Of all places, Gen Z's learned about this on TikTok. Take a listen. 
What can a typical elevator mechanic be made in a year? Easily over a hundred thousand. Um, my friend right now, he is currently working at the SpaceX uh, Starbase site. He's a master electrician, and right now he's making almost $180,000 a year. It's going to vary depending on the ski resort that you're at, but I bet you could get anywhere from well, 35 to to $40 uh, an hour. All right, so Mike, the, the difference, though, you've got an economic divide in America. You sort of have a class divide in America. Did the folks who are now taking these trade jobs up, even though they're making good money, master electrician, $180,000 a year, some you know, roughnecks, $100,000 a year and more, are, are they staying with working class traditional values or joining the values and politics of, shall we say, the elites who are making similar money? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I... Don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but my foundation specifically awards work ethic scholarships because we don't want to start the conversation simply with qualifications uh, or with grade point averages or with whatever your pedigree is. We want men and women who are enthused about showing up early and staying late and distinguishing themselves. That's a very unattractive narrative by and large today. The media just doesn't know what to do with it, and a lot of people feel like it's rooted in some kind of rapacious capitalism or goofy exploitation. It's not. It's the oldest recipe in the world for success. And the 2,000 people that my foundation's assisted all have that gene in common. They work. They'll go to where the work is. And that those videos are instructive, but... I talk to people, welders, every day who are making close to $200,000. Plumbers, steam fitters, pipe fitters, electricians, to your point. But it's a, it's a rung, you know, and it's not a bottom rung. The stigmas and the stereotypes that keep people from exploring these careers have been a huge problem in our country. And they're starting to erode the idea that that diploma on your wall is something other than a receipt is starting to take root and people are beginning to hold colleges, I think, a bit more accountable. It's like turning a a super tanker around at sea. These attitudes, these perceptions around the trades, it takes time. But I've been doing it for 16 years and I've never been as encouraged as I am right now. John Paul Getty, in terms of the age-old recipe for success, said uh, rise early, work hard and strike oil. Um, for his recipe for success. Um, Americans pessimistic about the future. 78% of Americans do not believe their children will be better off in the future. The least optimistic finding in the history of that poll, 36% of Americans still believe the American dream uh, is achievable. But if you've got a welder who can make $200,000 a year, how does that not speak to the American dream more alive than ever? Because you have to show them. You have to make a persuasive case for the opportunities that exist and for the prosperity that's currently being enjoyed by a long list of people who until very recently have been deemed to have earned some sort of vocational consolation prize. That data is is real. But Leland, the reality of the situation and the perception of the situation are actually no different. They feel the same. So when you say 34% of Americans still think the dream is alive and well, if I'm doing the math right, that means, that means 60, what, 6%? 60, 60, 60, yeah, it's 36% believe, so that uh, conversely means 64%, 64. don't believe. Yeah. That, that's scary, right? I mean, no, it's, 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 absolutely, it's absolutely terrifying. I guess what I'm trying to get at, though, is we talk a lot here about the, the divide in America. Uh, it's a class divide, but it's also a traditional Uh, versus elite values divide. Are you seeing um, either more respect or I'm almost wondering if there's even uh, the reverse happening, that the the credentialed class is now looking down their nose even more um, at the welder making $200,000 a year and driving his Ford F-150 and the roughneck who's working out uh, on the wells uh, in West Texas uh, who's making $150,000 a year and they're sitting there making $110,000 a year and trying to buy a Tesla to impress their friends, and they're even more willing to look down upon and to put their, their boot on the neck, politically at least, uh, through regulation and other things, on that working class folks. 
I think that what you're really talking about started with the great push for college for all back in the 70s when we took shop class out of high school and began telling a whole generation of kids that not only is a four-year degree a good thing to aspire to, but if you don't get one, you're screwed. And that's what happens with PR. It always goes too far. We weren't content to simply promote higher education uh, on its own merits. We had to promote it at the expense of all the other forms of education. And unfortunately, that set the stage for the kind of division that you're talking about. That's why Varsity Blues was a thing a couple of years ago. There, I'm very fortunate to live in a very nice neighborhood, and I, I know a lot of very concerned parents who will do anything to get their kids into the Ivy League. But now, even that's starting to shift. In 1955, the average GPA for a Harvard grad was 2.55. Today, it's 3.98. Do you really think those Harvard grads are that much exponentially smarter than they were 50 years ago? Of course not. Inflation hasn't just impacted the price of food and gas. It's impacted the credential themselves. And employers are starting to see that, too. And when you look at an institution like Harvard with $52 billion in an endowment who has inflated their credential right up to the point where everybody gets an A, you can start to see the whole architecture of this getting a little wobbly up there. Uh, You know what? It's a great point. And the number of employers who are demanding college degrees is going down. There's more jobs that are open. Um, Mike, fascinating conversation. Thank you. We appreciate it. Some great points, really, all all through it. And uh, we're excited. You're going to join Chris Cuomo Wednesday, April 10th, Trading Up, a special live event. Features a live studio audience along with the blue-collar millionaires who found success without a college degree. 8 p.m. Eastern on News Nation. Mike, thank you. We'll look forward to it. I'll be wearing the same shirt, probably. (laughs) Uh, hopefully, hopefully it gets washed once or twice between now and then. But hey, that, man, that, look, that, I'm sorry, but we got a million bucks at microworks.org right now. We're giving it away this month to help right. train the, the next the, generation. The, the shirt, it's the there. shirt issues between between you and Cuomo. You guys can adjudicate <laughs> that uh, th- then. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Mike. Adios. All right, good to see you. You know, this is a perfect thing for Donald Trump to be talking about over and over and over again on the stump as he travels America. He speaks in states like Michigan or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania that has exactly the kind of people uh, that Mike Rowe was just talking about, people who feel left behind. Uh, That's a perfect message for swing voters, for working class voters who were Democrats and are now up for grabs. But time and time again, Donald Trump continues not to do that. He talks about things his base loves, like yesterday on the stump. And what the hell was Biden thinking when he declared Easter Sunday to be Trans Visibility Day? Such total disrespect to Christians, and November 5th is going to be uh, called something else. You know what it's going to be called? Christian Visibility Day, when Christians turn out in numbers that nobody has ever seen before. All right. Trump's base loves moments like that. He's on a roll this week. His Easter social media storm doubling down on bloodbath. And then there is this. The 22-year-old nursing student in Georgia who was barbarically murdered by an illegal alien animal. Uh, the Democrats say, please don't call them animals. They're humans. I said, no, they're not humans. They're not humans. They're animals. Nancy Pelosi told me that. She said, please don't use the word animal, sir, when you're talking about these people. I said, I'll use the word animal because that's what they are. Connecticut and Wisconsin last night, Nikki Haley got double digit support in the Republican primary. She dropped out a month ago. Corey Lewandowski is with us, former Trump campaign manager, New York Times bestselling author. Corey, it is good to see you. Uh, Are we going to ever get general election Donald Trump? Well, Leland, look, I think we're really there. You know, what did Donald Trump do yesterday? He went to two battleground states, uh, states that are going to be critical in the general election. The general election has started. He is the de facto nominee. Joe Biden is the de facto nominee for the Democrats. The wild card continues to be. What does RFK pull 
look, he just made the ballot in another state. The question is, does his presence in those states where he's now on the ballot and he's picked his running mate, a far left progressive, how much impact does that have on those individuals who are unhappy both with Donald Trump and with Joe Biden? And it's very possible, and we've seen this in the past, a third party candidate like a Ross Perot who gets 20% of the vote dooms the incumbent president and allows for the challenger to be successful, we could see a repeat just like we did in 1992. Fair, fair enough. Um, look, history rhymes. It doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but your, your point's well made. It could be 1992. It could be 1980. It could be 1968. All, all of these things are there. Um, you say Donald Trump has moved into general election land. Um, the, the idea, though, of calling illegal aliens... Uh, animals, yes, he was referring to criminals, but then doubling down on bloodbath and in this cycle, right, where he says something, he feels like he gets uh, treated unfairly. There's the social media echo chamber. There's his friends calling. There's the TV echo chamber. And, and then he just keeps doubling down on it. How does that help convince swing voters that he's the guy that they want to have voted for in 2016, didn't vote for in 2020, but now they should vote for him in 2024? You know, Leland, here's the thing, you know, Donald Trump used the word bloodbath is the exact same word that Joe Biden used talking about one of the presidential primary elections. And so listen, if we're going to chastise Donald Trump for the language, then let's just be equal opportunists. But where are we really? Do the American people so much care about what Donald Trump says or about the record of accomplishments that he had when he was in office? It was just three short years ago where our enemies feared us okay, around no, the world. Corey, 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 perfect, perfect point. So, so why not just talk about that record over and over and over again? Just the record. Oh, and, I, and I think he will. Look, I think he will. You have to remember, Donald Trump has the opportunity to air grievances because I believe he's been wronged in the judicial system. Look, we know that he's now sitting for a case and he wants the opportunity to air grievances. And this notion, and I get it that this transgender thing happens to be on Easter, the holiest of holy days for us Catholics, you know, the day that Jesus himself risen from the dead. And Joe Biden then goes out and says he never put out a statement on this. We know that to be factually inaccurate. It, it was disappointing timing at minimum and slap in the face at maximum for us Christians. So look, Joe Biden could have been honest and said, yes, that was the day it always falls on. I had no control over it. He could, he could have chosen not to put out a statement on it, but he didn't, and then he lied about it. And when you're a practicing Catholic like I am and millions of others across the country, it's the holiest of holy days, Leland, and it's a day that should have been you know, dedicated to, to Jesus himself who rose. Well, we made, a, we made the point here. Um, it speaks to how difficult of a problem Joe Biden has uh, with his base, that he, he couldn't either A, be honest about it, or B, somebody in the political shop on Thursday go, I, I think we want to hold off on making any statements, uh, as you pointed out on Easter, because this is going to become a thing. But we know Donald Trump gets untreated fairly in the media. He's been talking about it since 2015. You've talked about it. He's a little bit, though, like a, a bull fighting a matador, and the matador ra waves the red, red flag. This is the media, and he charges at the red flag, and then the matador stabs him in the neck. And I'm wondering if at some point it wouldn't be easier politically or more, more beneficial politically to not keep charging at the red flag. Leland, I'll tell you, in 2016, it's been a long time since I've been, you know, st we started this thing. I came up with this little thing. It was called Let Trump Be Trump. And, you know, it's very difficult for us political operatives to second guess a man who's had so much success in his life, whether in the business world, the television world, or now in the world of politics. So I say you let Trump be Trump because the American people, and I've heard it thousands of times, right? Hey, if he just didn't say this on Twitter, hey, if he just didn't do this, hey, if he just didn't do that. Listen, people love Donald Trump for who he is, for the raw emotion that he brings to bear, for the, for the unfiltered nature. And look at, does it, does it make some people angry? It sure does, but there's nobody who wants to have a school system that their kids can't be safe in, a country that they don't secure their borders in, and a place that you can't have an economic success story. So look, at, you may not like, some people may not like the rhetoric of Donald Trump, but they love his policies and they have an opportunity in November to go back to those policies of securing our border, letting our kids have a safe school okay. system and having economic freedom. All right, Corey, thank you very much. Um, I think you would add, let Trump be Trump because trying to control him doesn't work either for a number of political operatives who have tried. It's sure. good to see you, appreciate, appreciate it, thank you. Thank uh, this you. is something that Donald Trump has talked about uh, on, on the stump a number of times. DEI, diversity, equity, 
and inclusion. We've been told all along that DEI is our strength. Diversity uh, in equity and inclusion makes businesses better and stronger. There's studies that show that. We'll fact check those studies with another study when we come back. Site, McKinsey and Company is a major consulting firm that recruits the elite of the elites from the Ivy League. They're so behind those four studies that argue DEI hiring in the boardroom were good for the bottom line. They were the ones who put them out. But not so fast, say researchers Jeremiah Green and John Hand, according to a new review of McKinsey studies. There really isn't a statistically significant correlation between earnings and the racial and ethnic diversity of executives. Author of Next Gen Marxism, What It Is and How to Combat It, senior fellow of the Heritage Foundation, Mike Gonzalez, joins us. Um, Mike, we're short on time, but I, I'm glad we're able to get to you tonight. Um, does this mean that sort of going back to the old world where judging people by uh, content of their character, not color of their skin, gets the best results? Yeah, I would say... Uh And good to see you, Leland. I would say let's go back to MLK and uh, not just content of character, although that, that should be the number one characteristic, talent, excellence, uh, uh, virtue, uh, you know, grit, all the things that we all would benefit from if the people who sell us stuff and to whom we sell stuff practiced. Counting people by race is one of the worst things we should do, we could do, especially in a country as multi-ethnic as America. Uh, no, no office, no courtroom, no classroom should be expected to, to reflect the, 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 the racial makeup of this of, of, of society. That is, so, that, that, that is a wrong approach because it means you're counting by race. All right, so we know the arguments, right? You know, studies show business that focus on DEI do better. It's not only the right thing to do, it's good for business. The Defense Department says that diversity is a necessity. Um, where, where is the line between saying we want to actually be diverse, which, which is a good thing, and we want to be representative of, of our country, versus saying we're going to justify discrimination against straight white men and somehow spin it to be a business imperative? You can't, and to do that is illegal and unconstitutional. But what you need to do is have diversity of opinions. A boardroom should have people who bring in different points of view, <clears throat> but a different point of view does not adhere, does not reside in DNA. And if you believe that, you're a rank racist. If you believe that a race comes with a set points as a set of ideas, then you're really racist. So, so what we need to have, if we want better outcomes, is to bring people with different, I want to, different, I, different no, insights. No, no, right. It, different, diverse, diverse ideas uh, does change things. Um, right. Look, there, this, is still, this is still happening in government. Here is uh, the new State Department DEI chief. Take a listen. And in order to make any change, we've literally got to be about the work of dismantling that traditional structure at every juncture. Quickly, your response. There you have it. It boils down to dismantling the cultural matrix of this country, dismantling the, 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 the structure of this country. She put it, she spoke to it. She actually said the truth. This is what they want to do. They want to dismantle America as we know it. This is why I titled my book Next Gen Marxism, because that is Marx's original idea. Yeah, no, and, and it started with destroying the family structure and then the, the cultural structure as, as well. Um, all right, Mike, thank you very much. Next Gen Marxism uh, is the book. Good to see you. We appreciate it. Coming up next, Caitlin Clark mm -hmm. and Angel Reese battled it out of the women's basketball game with more viewers than last year's World Series. But neither one will ever see a contract near what the average major leaguer makes. Even the minimum wage in the NBA is lower than the highest wages in the WNBA. Why it may not matter if they get paid the same money as men. Women's basketball is having a moment this year. And you can tell by how much the media can't stop talking about how they're talking about it. What a great thing for women's sports that we care. The Daily Show is making fun of TV anchors who've suddenly discovered the Iowa women's basketball team and its star player, Caitlin Clark. As a TV anchor who just discovered Caitlin Clark, 
I take offense. We care because you care. The LSU-Iowa game got 12.3 million viewers. That's more than any women's college basketball game. The 2023 NBA Finals and the 2023 World Series. Radio host America Tonight, Kate Delaney, is with us. Does this surprise you a little bit? It does surprise me. Other than the fact that she's the scoring machine and she now has the record with, what, 3,777 points. That's what she finished with. She holds the record for men or women in college basketball when it comes to pure points, Leland. And we Americans like our winners. We like people who score. And it's sexy and it's big. And she's selling jerseys. And she is the Taylor Swift of basketball. She puts butts in seats and money in pockets. All right. Uh, there's a lot there. I had no idea who held the point record before or even now, but you know who Caitlin Clark is. Um, she's not going to end up making you know, the big bucks um, that, you make, that you make in the NBA. She may make a lot on social media. You said she puts butts in seats. I'm wondering if this doesn't change the conversation, though, about girls' sports. I think it does for, what, for the reason I just said. She'll go number one in the WNBA draft. She goes to the Indiana Fever they win the sweepstakes. Right now, they have terrible attendance, just over 4,000. And on their lowest night, they have barely 2,500. 